Okay. And um, I suggest that we um, we go ahead and get started. Okay. And um, it looks like we have a very international group with us this day. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're sitting right now. Um, I'm welcome to Motivation Interviewing and Beyond. I'm Joel Porter, and I'm here with Steve Rolnick and a couple of really good friends of mine um, to talk about motivational interviewing training. And so I'm, um, I'm in Christchurch, New Zealand. I'm a psychologist, I'm a MI trainer, um, and um, looking forward to this conversation. And I know we have a lot of people in the audience who've done a lot of training too. So um, I'll be interested in everyone's thoughts. Steve, how are you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine, Joel. Um, I'm taking a few weeks off in, in Italy on the coast. So I'm nice. doing, doing bits of work as well as looking after one and sometimes two sons. So yeah, um, thank you. I'm very well and up for the session tonight. All right. So is there anything in particular you're curious about in terms of the training, the training MI? Because, you know, you, you kind of we're one of the original people, I think, that even trained anyone in motivational interviewing to begin with. I'm curious about us rather than them. That happens to be my, the puzzle I'm trying to solve at the moment, Joel. In other words, we're talking about training people in MI, but I'm very conscious of, of how any progress I've made has been connected to changes inside me. So I'll be very curious to uh, see what we make of that, but I don't mean to impose it on us. All right. Well, how about we go around and we introduce Nikki and Judith, and I'll let, I'll let y'all just introduce yourselves. Um, and you can say whatever you would like. I mean, you're, you're two very close friends of both Steve and I, and we're delighted that you decided to join us. Nikki, all the way from the Motor City. Yes. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> um, I'm Nikki Cochran. I'm a psychologist, um, works primarily with teenagers and young adults uh, with uh, various kinds of health uh, issues. And I have been fortunate enough to been introduced to MI, I feel like, well, eons ago, like a lifetime ago, but um, I get a chance to do trainings uh, locally and in various parts of the states and, uh, oh yeah, I'm in Detroit, sorry. Um, and uh, I, we have a few projects that we've worked on with our, in, in medical clinics around helping providers uh, in clinic utilize uh, MI to enhance, you know, improve adherence to various regimens uh, of our, you know, young uh, population of adolescents. And it's, I, I get a lot out of, you know, seeing you guys and help being helpful in whatever way and maybe, you know, just the joy of camaraderie and helping people do things differently. All right, that's you. And across the pond, Judith. Uh, yeah, good evening or good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. So I'm Judith Carpenter. Um, gosh, I've been in, involved in my training for a good well, well over two decades. And Steve, you were my first MI trainer. <laughs> you did. You were the person that trained me in MI back in the day in London all those years ago. Um, I'm now. I live. Um, I'm live in Derbyshire in the middle of, of England. Um, and I, I suppose. I mean, I'm training a lot. Actually, I do a lot of training. Have done a lot of training over the years. And at the moment, I train half the week, and I actually work as a clinician half the week. So I'm a uh, a specialist dietitian in diabetes and what's been really interesting is sort of practicing influencing training which influences practice so I sort of am at the cold face of what I do as well which I find quite interesting but um yeah and my training and just what we've gone through in the last couple of years I'm sure we're going to come on to it in terms of having to use these mediums which are marvelous for connecting but training is a real different thing and I've just been able to go back and do some face-to-face -face training which has just been a joy so I'm sure we'll talk about some of that stuff too. 
Thank you for having I me. I hope to do, because that'll be certainly in the present and the future of MI training. Now, <clears throat> Steve, I don't know if, if this is a true story or not, or or I've I've kind of worked it out in my head in a way that, that I, I'd like it to be. But I was thinking about what I what I'd heard about the first time you actually met Bill face to face. Was that that was in Sydney, right? And and you had read that first article that Bill had written about motivational interviewing, a sort of this thing that could be something. Now, did you read that article and start practicing MI and training people in MI? Yes, quite a few years before I met Bill. Okay. And um, the, the, the weird thing about it, looking back, Joe, is that um, in one of the first MI trainings that I ever did, it must have been in 1984, 1985, I combined it with CBT. And I ran it with Rhoda Emlyn Jones in Canterbury in Kent. We saw no difficulty in trying to integrate MI and CBT. Um, but yes, to answer your question, I'd done quite a lot of training by the time I went to Australia uh, to study MI and healthcare uh, for my PhD. And by complete coincidence, Bill was in the office next to me, also on a sabbatical or whatever for a year. And uh, we went out to lunch on the first day. And um, that started the kind of collaboration um, that's unfolded ever since. So kind of in some ways, Steve, you are sort of the first trainer in motivational interview. I guess maybe that's right. Yeah. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure I had the story straight because I've been telling I've, it for I've years. I've got a video that I made in 1985 called Motivational Interviewing, in, which was a training video, but it was outrageously creative. I did it with a friend. Uh, oh. But at, at that point, we didn't, nobody seemed interested in motivational interviewing. And at that point, we thought, oh, this is interesting stuff. And we were making up new concepts and new terms like linking summaries, which I still think was a really nice phrase to use. Um, but there you go. Yes, it was outrageously creative, youthful uh, energy. Is that video in digital format? I've got it, but it's going to cost put it a up lot. On of the, let's put it up on our YouTube site. It'll cost a lot of money for me to get rid of that. I, I'm ashamed of it. I tell you, you it's another <laughs> story. All right. Well, I'll get a Patreon site going saying, Steve, give up the video. Um, Okay, okay, good. Well, that sets the stage for the conversation. And so, so what year was that again, Steve? 84, 85. I was going with training. Okay, so, so we're good into, you know, almost three decades of, of MI training. Um, and I guess one of the things that, that I've, that kind of got me interested in training people in motivational interviewing because I because I, I never really anticipated training anybody in anything. Um, and then I and then I received the training in motivational interviewing from Bill and Terry in 1999 maybe. Yeah, 1999. And um, and I thought this is very different than any kind of psychological training I've ever had. Um, but it wasn't until four years until I went on to do the training of the trainers and then got into training. And, and I was living in New Zealand, and um, by default, there were only two of us in the country that had gone through the, the MI Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers, Train the Trainer. And Ann Flintoff, who was down at Massey University, was using it for teaching. And so then, b with the work of people like Doug Selman and Simon Adamson and the National Addiction Center and starting to spread motivational interviewing around, I got slotted in as the national MI trainer of sorts. And so I was running up and down the country training people in MI, not really sure how well I could even do motivational interviewing. Um, but I think I learned a lot more about doing motivational interviewing by teaching people in motivational interviewing. 
and training people in motivational interviewing. Um, and it's probably in terms of my career, it's probably the most consistent thing I've done since 2003, um, work-wise, is train people in motivational interviewing. So it's been it's been it's been amazing to me to kind of watch and see how the training goes. Now we'll we'll get into reflecting back on you know what you know what changed and what stayed the same. Um, but I'd be interested in hearing Nikki and Judith how, how you got wrapped up in in my training. Whoever wants to go first, just jump in. Should I go? Um, yeah. I was, yeah. So, as as a non psychologist, and as a and and as being trained in healthcare, as as maybe many people who are listening to this, there was there was no psychology or really limited psychology in my undergraduate degree, um, and I was training dietitians nationally in the UK in counselling skills training training which was novel in itself um the sort of medical model existed was the only model really i suppose in healthcare and and when i i did i when i did the counseling skills training I, I really enjoyed the process and understanding and being able to to have some really good listening skills but it, it didn't feel enough to be able to um to help me do something different with people that I was working with and when I came on the training with Steve that was the moment it was I mean I think a lot of people say this when they meet MI you don't know what you're looking for and then MI suddenly is it and I was really curious and I was very novice in all of this and I think Steve I don't know if you can recall this conversation I had a conversation with you way back saying how do I get to do more of this and you said well there's this training of new trainers and I went along to this training of new trainers um, back in 2000. And really, I couldn't uh, couldn't train them at motivation interviewing. I sort of was, and I liked it as a practitioner. I had, again, like you, Joel, my plan wasn't to train it. I just wanted to get more proficient at it. And there didn't seem to be those avenues in the same way. So I sort of stumbled into training by default, but actually I really loved it. <laughs> I found it just was such a good fit and and I still the thing I, I I resonate it's the thing that's been most consistent for me too and I love every single training that I go and do even now um it's a joy I find it just a, a joyful way to to really work and, and support people to do something different I predominantly train in healthcare I do some social care and a bit of substance misuse over here but not much but for healthcare it's I, I think it has it has been and continues to be rev revelationary, I would say, cool. certainly here in the UK. All right, Nikki, how'd you, how'd you get it connected up with this mob? I got, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Sylvie <laughs> uh, Narking was my, uh, my connection because we worked together and it seems like this little area in, uh, in Detroit had uh, a handful of uh, of MI practitioners. And so I was fortunate enough to get uh, pulled in. And I, I started, so I, I went to a training um, that Sylvie had done. And I I think more, I mean, a little bit differently than you guys is I was a practitioner, um, you know, relatively new, like right after postdoc. And so I was using uh, MI with uh, teenagers and young adults with, you know, I had one set, I was working with kids with diabetes, who was, you know, uh, blood sugars were out of control and um, kids with asthma and families. And so I got a chance to be, you know, and Sylvie had several projects that we, you know, had us working on. So I got to get a lot of like hands-on training um, on, the, on the particulars of MI. So I wasn't really training other people. I was just going to a lot of trainings and practicing in every aspect of my day-to-day -day psychology life <laughs> in, a, in a hospital or outpatient clinic. And then, um, you know, as we were, you know, doing these and we were getting, you know, more and more projects, Sylvie's like, I think maybe you could train. I'm like, I don't think so. I think I like doing this. And you know, um, I guess that's what we all sort of see when we work with other visionaries. They can see things about us that we can't see um, in ourselves. And so under her tutelage and under you guys is, um, I, you know, 
went and did my first TNT in in my in Bulgaria in Sofia, uh, and was it was. I, I knew I liked MI. Am I fit with my style of interaction anyway, and how I like to talk with with uh, clients or you know other people? And but when I went to the TNT and then I met all of you all, and I was I, it was like my mouth dropped to the floor, and I was like, I'm home. It did. It really fundamentally fit with how I do things and my thought process, and it was so wonderful to find a collective group of people who do lots of different things in different ways, but we have one fundamental sort of ideal and that is just really wonderful. So I do trainings on smaller scales probably than you do, but I, I get a chance to train, you know, psychiatry residents, psychology students, um, med students, uh, sometimes uh, practitioners who are, you know, some in the you know medical arena, um, just about how to interact differently with people. And it's been really kind of cool. Cool. So, you know, I think a lot of us, you know, who do this, and I don't know about other areas of, of ACT, CBT, other, other approaches, but a lot of the people I know that train MI kind of stumbled into it, particularly in the early days. It was like, you know, there it was like not a secret, but you kind of had to wander into it by accident almost. And somebody would say, why don't you do some training? Okay, now one of the other things that they kind of really kind of early on got me real interested in MI was it was one of the first approaches where they were actually looking at, you know, can you actually train people in doing this? Is there any evidence to support this, this approach that continues to be promising and helping people make changes in, in, um, in, in behaviors? Um, and we believe now let's look at, is there evidence that we can teach people how to do it where they can carry on to provide training. And that that was some of that early work. And I think Denise and Bill did some of those studies. Um, but and I don't know of much other research that's been done in training people in motivational interviewing or training trainers in motivational interviewing. Well, how about y'all? Do y'all know anything about, about that? I know that Mike Mazin down at um, in Mississippi was doing some research a few years ago around that, that kind of training outcome. Was anyone aware of any recent last 10 year studies that have been done on training people in motivational interviewing in terms of training trainers in motivational interviewing? Have, have we crossed that bridge yet? Audience as well. I know we got some quite learned people out in the audience. be an interesting road to go down because when I look at when I look at the training and I look at the colleagues that I know around the world we all do similar things but we do it quite differently sometimes and there's no manual on how you train how you have to train people in motivational interview I guess Joe, I was going to say not necessarily research, but I know within the Mint organization where there's been that real focus on what makes a good trainer and competencies and those, the, the sort of, that's gone down towards the sort of certification process. There's something in there around the competencies of what, what, what good training looks like and what it might consist of. Um, and that's certainly been around, I think, for the last 10 years or more, hasn't it? And what, I'm going to put you on the spot here, Judith. What are some of the competencies that, that you can that come to mind? Um, oh, modeling MI to train MI. <laughs> There's something around that, if I remember rightly. And there's probably someone sitting here with the competence. I don't have the competencies. Um, um, so knowing, a, 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 understanding the, the concepts, the, the translation of that, modeling MI multimodal training there's lots of i think there was eight competencies that we that the mint as a as an organization were, were looking at or have looked at and have formulated in terms of what makes a good mi trainer but that's a real million dollar question isn't it really yeah so, yeah no it is. well i guess and i and i guess my experience has been it's the out it's the end result of the training experience that that is what i am teaching people, training people and leading them to um, 
become more proficient, is the word we use in MI, more proficient in the motivational interviewing. And, and there's some expectations around, you know, we used to talk about what's the point of two-day workshops. Mm -hmm. Do you remember those days? Um, you know, if people aren't going to sign on for the for the long haul and go to all the way to coaching and proficiency, then what's the point of doing that? Um, there's Mike Madison. Okay. Um, and I'm kind of wondering now, I mean, the competencies and all that's good. It's good to have some structure around what we do and some things to work towards and to, and to be able to assess and things that we believe to be true and helping people learn motivational interviewing. But I guess the end result is, does it, does it really? Or are there different ways to doing it that we that we're not we're not aware of? Or, I don't know. So don't know. some folks have posted some stuff in the chat around this. David tells us there's not a literature on training trainers, but there's a literature on skill acquisition. And there's an article. Yeah. There's an article. Is that by Jen Frey Margot discussing competency and proficiency? So there's some some of some of our learned colleagues here, Joel. We might want to bring them in <laughs> to talk yeah, about. We will. Andy we, we definitely will. Yeah. So Steve, and your because you, you still do some training, and I know you do a good bit of it now in the sports world, and that might be different than your early days in the substance abuse world. And when you started off training and then moved into behavioral health, what what has changed in the way you approach? make a training session when somebody says can you give a can you give us some training and motivational interview what's changed the way about the way you go about it uh, Joel I think I started with the illusion I don't want to say delusion but the illusion that this was something that other people didn't know anything about it was highly specialist it was something out there beyond their usual practice and my job was to explain to them everything about this highly specialist activity and fast forward it's probably 40 years joe maybe yeah it's probably just under 40 years fast forward 40 years um and i now have a completely different way of looking at it so I would start on the assumption that they know a lot about this already, that it involves them knowing, having a reflective capacity themselves about how they feel, how they are with other people, how they anticipate, how they develop their relationships with other people and anticipate and notice what's happening in that relationship. Um, but I think the most important change for me has been this observation, this, this conviction that I have that most of what's required is inside them and requires uh, a heightened sense of, a heightened ability to reflect about themselves and other people rather than it being something they don't know about that's incredibly specialist. So it's a quite different set of um, assumptions that I bring to the training that makes the training very, very different. So I would want to start with an equal emphasis on them and the relationship and the people they speak to. I'm sorry if that was a bit long-winded, but I'm trying to summarize no. the last years of. No, no. I mean, I think that I think that that's almost a very natural shift over time. In regards to my own kind of thinking about looking back at my training, where you know I needed to be the expert in the room with you know, 150 slides and, you know, now just, it's a very different. Nikki, how about you? How, how has your training changed or not over the, over the years you've been, you've been doing this? Uh, well, 
I, I can think of, I mean, there's probably many, many ways that it's changed, but one, I think, uh, when I think back to when I started, I mean, part of it is being new and not, you know, sort of knowing the, the skill and not being comfortable enough, yes, you know, to teach it in a way that makes sense. But I think over time I've become, you know, with a lot of practice, much more comfortable um, in, you know, so uh, how I, you know, translate materials into activities that make sense. And because I feel more comfortable, then I'm able to sort of get out of my own way and be more helpful and maybe um, more practical in helping other people, you know, tweak their things. I can see things in them better because I'm no longer paying attention to how I'm doing it. Like, I know this is what it says and this is the activity, but, you know, being able to, to, to feel comfortable enough to do that without having to rely on that makes me more available to the people I'm training, if that makes sense. So that's changed over time because I don't have to, I sort of got out of my own way. Um, and I'm, I'm more present in what's happening in front of me and being able to give enough examples and enough pull to sort of pull people back in to remain engaged and coming up with things that are relevant to them that they feel that they can then move forward or use going, you know, going forward. So I think that's probably changed. I'm less all over the place in my own head. And if that right. makes sense. Yeah, it makes, makes good sense. And so since um, you're TNT, Judith, and your first training to the one you're doing this week, um, mm -hmm. what's, what's different for you? Well, I think for myself, I, I mean, I just remember having huge imposter anxiety and, 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 and teaching to the text. I think that was, I was like, you know, you know, like really looking at the, at the, of what I, what I'd learned to try to translate it. And I, and I think I also got in my own way, Nikki, and I, when I would think about back training back then and now, gosh, I just, it's, the wisdom is always in the room. <laughs> That's what I've learned. Um, and my own curiosity as a trainer about what people want to learn. And actually my sense, sense is people take away from something like MI, tra MI training what they need um, and people's needs are different. And I don't think it matters if they don't, I think they, it's, it's having that sense of them, people themselves having a sense of being able to recognize what they already do and what they might choose to do differently. And, and being sort of brave enough and curious enough themselves to have a go. So I think what I do spend a lot of time doing, I've noticed in training now, is creating the space that makes some of that possible, which I don't think I focused on previously back sort of two, two, uh, two decades ago or so. So that's created a different quality, I think, and a different flavor of training. Um, I try and declutter it, less is more always. People can't necessarily always grapple with lots of different concepts. And in my experience, many people can, but they, in terms of what, what, what you're trying to do with people. And I think one of the things that's been really interesting is doing virtual training and breaking it down into chunks of time, which has been really interesting in how people are then learning. So there's been lots of changes for me. Um, and I continue to, Every group is different, so every training is different. And being re recognizing doing some training online or doing some training face to face is, is just a starting point on their journey. And we all know that, that it takes a lot more than just uh, one exposure to some, 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 hopefully, some decent MI training. So, so. In terms of creating that space, that sort of learning space where people are open to learning and how do you do that how do you create a space gosh now you put me on the spot Jill. um gosh i don't know <laughs> i just know that i'm doing it. i think there's something about making people feel really valued about what they already do you know people say on training all the time i already do some of this and i think they really do and, it, and they're meeting themselves and having certainly a lot of the people i train in healthcare that have really busy sort of overloaded work days, creating some space for them to think about their effectiveness and 
some of the things that they may choose to do in terms to consider how to change that. So there's something about allowing, slowing everything down and allowing some space to happen. And I don't think necessarily any of us, unless we stop and think about it, necessarily think how we do things. No. Yeah. No, we, we learn how to do things incrementally or we just yeah. intuitively know sometimes. Um, but I was thinking about what Nikki said about feeling more confident. Mm. And I wonder how that, when you, when, you, when you as a facilitator of a training, how that helps to create some of that space where they believe that you could actually hold it. I, I think it might be similar to, you know, how, you know, we the, sort of that main tenet of spirit. Like, what do we do with our own, you know, I think of how I interact with the kids I see and how do I create that spirit where someone feels heard, listened to and valued and extending, I guess, with training, extending it to a, a, a larger group of people instead of just one. But I think the mechanism might be similar to how you interact with that one person one-on-one -on -one to set a safe space. And I, and I wonder about creating that sort of welcoming uh, space, how that fits with what Steve was talking about, about people be able, being able to reflect on themselves and somebody had wanted Steve to elaborate a bit more on that. Um, do you have some more thoughts on that, Steve, about? Yeah, I, I, I'm, con I'm conscious of it being the end of the day here and I'm hoping I don't sound woolly. Um, but I didn't mean to suggest that in, in training MI, I don't have a clear sense of what MI is, which I do, I feel, and have a and feel able to convey that to them. So that I feel is very important to be able to say, look, this is, this is MI. And I usually start trainings with a single slide of a consultation. It, it's in an African setting that is very beautiful. And it's, it's very heartfelt and it's high quality MI. But I, I, what I do when I share that with them is ask them how they feel about it. So that them becoming aware of how that consultation makes them feel and what is in it, what is there in that that is special. And then the spirit that, that Nikki's talking about becomes something that they can recognize and start to live and breathe. And I find that in doing that and helping them to reflect about the way they feel, it drops the, the you know, Judith talked about slowing things down. It kind of drops the, the depth of learning to a place where they see something that's very profound and very special and are, are capable of, of, of recognizing it and and sharing it, as well as the obverse, as well as seeing a, 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 a conversation that is abrasive and confrontational and being able to, to feel inside them what it is about that that is so um, unpleasant and unhelpful. And so I don't know if I'm being clear here. So to be able to reflect about that is really important. And then I think there's a, a second element, which I bet you uh, Judith and Nikki can speak to with greater clarity than me, which is that MI is not just about listening to people. You know, that, that's a hugely important foundation, as is, as is the spirit and attitude of, of, of compassion and curiosity and acceptance of this person. It's the most fabulous foundation and it's very powerful. But the way we've presented MI and practice it is that it's, it's more than just that. It, it involves evoking from them in a forward-looking manner a vision of how things might be better for them. And that forward-looking purposeful quality to MI is very often mis not quite seen. And a lot of MI training 
um, can give people the wrong impression that this is really just about being empathic. And it's not just that. So I find that is a really is a really big challenge, Joel, is to is to get that aspect of am I across to people. Mm. Um, but in the in the single slide that I showed at the beginning, it's got both of those qualities, a wonderful sense of of hope and even love in the opening minutes of this consultation. But there's also a very clear sense of, look, what are we here to talk about and how can we help you lead a healthier life? Um, and it's that wonderful combination um, of, of empathic listening and promoting growth that for me is, is very, very special. But it can be seen in the uh, tremendous work of sports coaches that I know and work with. Mike Porteous is with us tonight. Honestly, if we can get him on, you'll meet someone who really uh, does a lot of this very naturally. Wonderful teachers, wonderful parents, wonderful pastors. They have this ability to tune in with hope and love towards people in such a way that it promotes growth. So most of MI is inside this kind of high quality human being and what I think we championing which is well worth championing is that extra focus on the skills of evoking and I think it's a fantastic contribution but I don't think MI is the specialist method that people don't know anything about and I hear in Judith's account uh, and I'm fascinated Judith because you I've known you for many, many years. You still speak with complete delight about training in MI. And I don't. I'm, <laughs> I've had enough, you know what I mean? And I find it very stressful. And I find it difficult to regulate myself emotionally and prepare myself, let alone recover afterwards. And yet you somehow seem to be able to keep going decade after decade. And I don't think it's a coincidence. I think the impression I get from you, Judith, is that you don't feel this weight on your shoulders, which perhaps is my problem, to convey all the stuff to people and to help them learn this stuff. You, you, you find it a lot easier than me to go, look, folk, we're here to learn. What would you really like to learn? What would you like to know about MI? This is a journey we're going on together. And I wonder whether that's not how you've survived all these years, Judith, because I feel such a pressure on my shoulders when I train that I can't wait to get out of there, if I'm really honest. Steve. <laughs> um, that's really interesting. Um, I do find it joyful. I still find it joyful. And I think there's, but I think there's something around what you talk about really clearly. It's skillful. So uh, being able to help people become more skilled so I, I come from the as you know from the world of healthcare um, and like many other worlds where people are trying to be helpful fixing other people is de rigueur so helping people so the other thing I think that is really part part and parcel of this Steve is that recognition and helping people to unlearn things which at times I think is as hard as the learning but when there's something very joyful when people start to unlearn and start to be able to do something differently if they choose to, that starts to get different results. I mean, one of the things that for me in training am I, and I, I to speak to your point around when the, the, just the empathic listening piece and around the spirit of the, of the nature of, and the intention of the interaction, that's the bit people really seem to grasp really well as a starting point and and I'm sure there's others. I can see some very, say, some great colleagues on this call that might might be in, would have something to say around this as well. Helping people to transition to that evoking piece, and to be able to do that skillfully is the thing that really it's like a hump. I see it as the getting over the hump of MI really. And when people start to get that, then they really start to see change. Help people, help people, the people they're working with to see change. But they start to see change in themselves. 
So I think there's, there is the joy around watching in the same way that my, I have with watching the people that I work with, with, largely young adults with type one diabetes change and grow. The same joy is there with the training because people start to start, not everybody, but people start to get it and it makes a difference. It's really powerful. Um, I mean, I have no, I mean, I have little experience because of my own training in other psychological methods. I have a little bit, but for me, am I, it's like a steady pulse. It just is a really helpful way to have really good conversations with other people. So I suppose that if I pull all that together, that continues my joy. Maybe when I stop feeling, feeling joyful, Steve, I'll hang my training, training pen up. <laughs> um maybe but it hasn't stopped yet so it's an interesting thing because you know what we're not talking about is how do you teach people to do complex reflections and what a ratio of questions or reflections should you have or or things like that which are important right i mean you know the the, the, the reflective listening is kind of the conduit to getting into the evoking and asking good open-ended questions. And what we're I'm thinking, I'm even thinking about our last webinar when what we got to talking about was the relational aspect and the experiential aspect of doing and now training motivation. And there's something about um, working with people in a way where they start to get curious, not only about themselves, about their other person, but about themselves and how they do things and start thinking about why do I do it this way? And, you know, I can remember doing trainings in, in places around the world where the learning paradigm is you're the, you're the lecturer, I'm the student, so I'm going to sit here and passively learn. And I'm expecting lots of lecture, 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 lecture. And um, I think MI took them off guard. MI training took some people off guard because it's, as Steve Berg was saying in, in his lovely uh, post, um, you know, yeah, there, in an introduction of motivational interviewing, there's going to be some talking bits because people don't know much about it. But when you intersperse that with um, learning exercise and you get people actively practicing things and doing things, um, it catches them off guard a little bit. Um, and it's interesting to see that kind of shift where people relax into the training a little bit more and they're willing to take some risks. And, and do some practice exercises where they might do some self-disclosure in a, in a real play, um, or they'll practice reflecting listening in a smaller in a small group to get some coaching and feedback on how to do it. Um, but there's something about that sort of you know that sort of setting the stage or creating the space, as you say, Judith, that that's really important from the get-go, from the beginning. Because it's hard to do it if things start to go off sideways. <laughs> it's hard to get it back um, if there's a break in that somehow. Um, and so one of the things we, we've gotten to is, okay, you know, if we sort of follow, you know, sort of the four processes idea is that if you can get good engagement with people and you can get people, get people with you, whether you're doing it by evoking from them their feelings about a session or however however you get people involved in a training. Um, and you want to start teaching them about and how to do motivational interviewing. You know, I mean, what I hear people saying these days is less is more, you know, teach people how to do things, not as much talking. I'm wondering, I always kind of think, and I'm thinking more about the the, the two-day Stand, you know, the introduction to motivational interview. I don't think it's a two day standard one now with Zoom. Is how do you blend in the this is what motivational interviewing is with this is how to do it? Because I've been in trainings where people just want to know how to do it and they don't really care about what it is. Well, they care about it, but they're not that interested in trying to understand what these different aspects are. So, how do I do it? What's the script? What's the recipe? How do I put it together? Because I got to get change talk, because that's what I hear I'm supposed to get. Whoever wants to jump in on and follow that or 
It's more than welcome to. Whatever Judith's going to say next is what I think. I know she's about to say it. Look, the, <laughs> to, to jump to the question of how you do this before grasping the spirit of it inside your own heart. It's a mistake. That so Judith's nodding her head, and I think I suspect Nikki agrees as well. So <laughs> I wouldn't like to conduct training in that way. The, 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 the fundamental insight we're trying to help people get to is that this is a way of being with people. And it's that way of being that helps people, helps you as a practitioner get out of their way, helps them get out of their own way while they are brave enough and you are privileged enough to be there with them while they talk about how things might be different. And to jump to how do you do it, is um, not going to be helpful. Mm. Um, and of course, that, that insight wasn't there for me when I first started training in MI. And I think something we haven't touched on is that there's a, an obvious parallel process here between the way we are with them and with the way we're hoping they are with others, and probably the way we are with ourselves which is, I feel, uh, uh, something that I've really had to learn the hard way. I've really had to learn that one. Um, and to be much more reflective about myself and my own emotional state um, uh, in order to practice MI well, let alone train others. Mm. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. Um, Joel... I'm wondering whether it would be enjoyable to bring a couple of people on board. Sure. I noticed the times 10 to the hour. Okay. And I wonder, yeah. I wonder if we could give a couple of other, others an opportunity to share reflections. I'm a little bit concerned though about whether we are attending to the kind of issues that you, Joel, wanted us to. And I'm not... I'm not wishing to steer this conversation in any way. No, Steve, I've, I've, you know, you know how we are with the webinars. We we start off in a direction and we start to meander and we end okay. up where we end up. Then can we then can we get see if Steve Berg Smith, Margot, if if Steve Berg Smith would like to come on because he, Steve is somebody who, had probably taught me more about MI training than anyone else. Um, he's uh, someone I hold very dear in my heart. Indeed. And um, where are you, Steve? I've invited is, him. Is he with us? He is with us somewhere. Yep, so the other, the other thing I'd quite like to do, ah, here's our boy. The other thing I'd quite like to do is see whether uh, Mike Porteous would like to come on because he's new to the MI field. And he's a sports coach. And I'm very interested to know what Mike feels about the parallels between teaching athlete skills on the one hand and teaching people MI on the other. Um, so at some point it would be nice to bring Mike on, but we've got Steve and Margot with us. And um, could we give you each a few minutes to share your reflections. And then Joel, if you could see if you could find Mike Porteous. Steve. 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 Good to see you, good to see all of you. I was thinking about when my shift happened in the way I approach MI training. Some of you heard this story and I'll 
here it is. It, more than 20 years ago, I, my, I, I facilitated an MI training for my wife's work team, which I wouldn't do again. But anyway, she um, worked in a behavioral medicine clinic with a bunch of practitioners, and she invited me to her workplace to facilitate a three-hour MI training. And I put a lot of work into this training. I, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to shine. I, I wanted to. Um, I wanted to show up in a way that would would honor her, honor her colleagues. So anyway, I I took this group through a three hour training, and at the end of the training, um, she and I went out to lunch, and I sat down, we made our order, and I said, "So, what did you think?" And she said, "Do you really want to hear?" And I said, yeah, I really want to hear. And she said, well, first off, you know a lot about motivational interviewing. You know how to talk about it. You showed some interesting videos. You were clearly passionate about MI and that came across. And, and then I said, and? <laughs> and? And she said, well, do you really want to hear? what I thought. And I said, I really want to hear. And, and, and the only way that my wife could speak to me, which she spoke to me in the moment, was this way. She said, Steve, first off, you talk too much. There was way too much information, too many slides. There were too few activities. And in fact, the activities seemed like token activities. I didn't really feel you modeling motivational interviewing. You weren't demonstrating it for all of us in the moment. And frankly, I got bored pretty quickly. And the last thing is, it wasn't multimodal. You didn't take advantage of all of the learning tools that are out there to support different learning styles and to guide the learning in a way that people would find interesting and captivating and engaging. And then I said, multimodal what? <laughs> so, you know, it's been more than 20 years. And since then, I've been on my own journey to put into practice the feedback that she offered me. And I'll leave it with that. And I have to add on, I became more multimodal when I went to one of your presentations, Steve, and watched what you did during one of them. I started incorporating some of that on how to keep my participants active and engaged in the session because I watched you do it and I had some of that to bring back with me. So I just want to give you that it does flow. <laughs> it truly flows. And, and it takes practice. Yes. It takes practice. I used to train other techniques and treatment techniques, and I've been training for 30 years. I didn't become a competent trainer until I started letting go of the prescribed way to train. And I started listening to my participants. One of the things that I've instituted with another colleagues, I co-train, and Judith mentioned that at the beginning, but I do a lot of co-training, is that we do assessments beforehand of what our, our trainees want out of a training and what topics they want, and we gear the trainings individually to each one of them. So there is no cookie cutter training. It's and even during the training, we're modifying constantly during the training and doing what they feel that they need. They're, as long as they have the spirit, the tools will come later on. Really teaching them the spirit and how to engage, that's the most important piece because we can build on that afterward. Um, it took me a while to figure that out because I liked being the expert. I loved being the expert. And once I left go of my experting, I became a better trainer. So when you say you teach the spirit first and the tools will come along, what tools are you talking about, Margaret? 
Uh, the tools of MI, of uh, the ORs, of darn cat, of what types of reflections are there, how to do a complex reflection, how to do a simple reflection. I don't teach that. I'll do a, right now I'm doing three days, uh, three, four hour days of training online. In the first four hours, we don't talk anything about tools. We just talk about what spirit is and really take it apart through ex experiential practice. Um, and so we'll intersperse different kinds of exercises to go to a certain component of the spirit. And so by the time we get to the second and third days, we're already feeling comfortable. We understand spirit and just bringing the tools on how to work in a session with the client makes it easier for the practitioners. What are you thinking, Nikki, as you're listening? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree. You know, the, the constant sort of tailoring as the, you know, as the training goes on to make sure that you're meeting the needs that the participants want. Um, and, and also making things uh, varied and um, interesting so that I guess I, I sort of think in my head, like I, you know, when I go to trainings, I don't want to be bored. I want to be engaged. I want to be you know, I don't want to just sit there and have the slides read to me. So what can I do differently? And so because I wouldn't want that, I try to make the trainings that I do much more interactive. I'm not sure how multi, I, I, I think I use various modes, but I probably have to I probably tweak that some more. But um, just doing things to keep people engaged and listening to them more about what they want and then trying to model and be mindful of how, to give that to them in a way that they can viscerally feel and also see, and then they can start practicing. Yeah. If that makes sense. So I just, yeah. No, that's beautiful. Sorry, Judith, go ahead. I was just gonna say, it's just so lovely listening to everybody because it's just, there's so many different ways to do this and there's no right way. It reminds me of like great chefs who may all cook a, a cook a dish that has the same is the, is the same dish but it will taste slightly differently and I think that's the there's something about the authenticity of being able to be comfortable enough in your own skin to train the way that makes sense to you and the spirit is and all the things we're talking about are things that I'm sure everyone who is training MI and getting more proficient and competent in it is bringing in and it's not a manual when it's not manualized as such so but there's something about the authenticity of your own style which I think is it takes a long time to develop maybe that's what we're all sort of saying in different ways it takes you know mm. maybe Steve got to, and his wife give him some some honest feedback but it really made a difference but it takes a while to develop your style and it takes a while I guess to create your dish but we're all doing it differently and I think that's that's the lovely thing that I love about MI um, and, I, and I'm going to be doing some TNT stuff this year. I'm just really, it's lovely listening to everyone talk about this because we're going to have people in a room that will be coming into the, to the Mint organization who will hopefully be able to create and develop their own style of training. So, so what Judith is talking about is a training of new trainers Yeah. with the motivational interviewing network of trainers that we do once a year, maybe two or three times in different places. Okay. Just for people that aren't familiar with the act. Yes, there is Joe. So, um, I'm getting this feeling of like the group of us here broadly agreeing. <laughs> and I noticed Molly is saying something a little different and almost like apologizing for it and saying, I'm not recommending you do it this way, but this is my. This is my process, and it's it's quite different to mine. And and can you bring Molly McGill on, and then also yeah, line Molly's, Molly's can you always also like line up a Mike Porteous because I've, I've Mike, sent Mike an invite. Thank you, but no Molly, would you like to come in and speak as openly and as creatively as you wish about your process? It's well, interesting. Well, Molly's, well, Molly's coming on. I just had this thought. 
I've never had the, uh, the opportunity to, to train with or witness one of Steve's training, but boy, I've heard the stories. Um, and the freedom, Steve, that you, that follows you in the way you train and your openness of just being yourself in the training room um, comes through a lot of, a lot of, a lot of practice and a lot of confidence and a lot of trust in yourself. Um, and you train, I think a lot of your training is different than probably what a lot of the way a lot of people train um, in terms of bringing in drums and, and, you know, getting people moving around and kind of, you know, creating a little, uh, um, a festival kind of experience is kind of the way I kind of get it is that people are up and moving around. So that's, that'd be very different than, than I would train in some way. So it's, it's interesting. Hey, Molly, nice to see you again. Hi, hi everyone. So you're always welcome back. <laughs> thank you. So um, yeah, I I love this conversation, but my tendency is always going to be like, you know, how do we how do we operationalize this and turn it into a bulleted list? <laughs> and and so how I was thinking about my own process, and my process is very context specific. I teach uh, masters of social work students in the context of an addiction course where we spend maybe three to four sessions on MI that does culminate in a 20 minute role play that they do that I might decode and give them feedback on. Um, so I definitely start with what it is and the spirit, um, but I move quickly to ORs probably uh, because of my context and how much time I have, um, but also because these students are very well trained in asking closed-ended questions and providing helpful advice and doing a lot of um, strength-based, uh, you know, like affirmations, basically, Like right? Social work students are amazingly good at affirmations. Um, so yeah, like reflections and open-ended questions and really just learning how to talk in reflections, I feel like is a, is a technical, is a retraining of how you talk and it's a retraining of how you think about conversations. Um, and so I, I move pretty quickly to a technical aspect and I, um, I do say this thing, you have to be a technician before you can be an artist because they're like, I feel weird. I feel like a robot, I'm a robot, I'm a robot. And I'm like, yeah, you're gonna totally be clunky and weird. And if you come from a good place and you come from the spirit, it will be okay. And people will forgive you because people are so forgiving. Um, but if you get through this hump, these two things will come together. And yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess I'm like, feel a little embarrassed or weird about it. Like, no, you don't. Because I no, think I'm... only because like people are always like, well, Molly, technique, technique, technique. So I feel like I have a reputation of being. Well, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I appreciate you, you saying that because I was, I was thinking about Margot and I, I could see Margot doing four hours on the spirit of motivational interviewing. And, and, and taking people on a kind of a magical journey. I can't see doing that. <laughs> you know, I probably, I probably kind of blend a little bit of the teaching the technical because for a lot of people, this is brand new. And they already embody the spirit or they resonate towards it. I've never had anybody in a training when I talk about the spirit of motivational interviewing, get up and walk out and say, I can't do that. I don't agree with that. You know, if for, in some ways it gives people permission, particularly people that have been trained as technicians to kind of enter more of themselves into the conversation with somebody and kind of naturally allow those feelings of acceptance and compassion um, and, and collaboration to work. But, but it's a skill set that people really struggle with, particularly shifting from closed in into open questions, then becoming more comfortable and confident and relying on reflections to carry a conversation. 
Yeah. I, I noticed David, Dave Rosengren, who I think has gone off to the dental hygienist and is, and is tapping away in his phone in the car or something. But, you know, David, I reckon if we've given the impression that you should teach spirit first and then technique, I think it's a mistake for me personally. Okay. Uh, that's that single slide that I shared with you in the chat column earlier. The question I would ask people about that is what do you notice? And some people will, it's like showing people a dance form and some people will notice the movement and the relationship and other people will notice the dance steps. And the, the challenge as a trainer is to pay equal respect to both. The, both the style and the attitude, as well as um, the beauty of what is actually said. So, you know, but that's me. So I tend to kind of see it, I don't polarize it. I tend to see the two of them as going forward together uh, and you can't have one without the other. I agree. And, and Steve, just to add on to that, when I talk about teaching spirit, I'm not just teaching spirit at that point, I'm doing reflective listening and the exercises are reflective listening exercises, but we don't name them as reflective listening. We say, okay, we're going to be doing continuous reflective listening. We do that exercise during the training, but we don't call it that. We just say listening with, the, with only being able, with no questions. How do you listen without questioning? And how do you give the spirit at that point. And so as we're bringing exercises in, we're not talking about what the skills are. We're teaching the skills to make them comfortable with them. And then we're naming them later. It's beautiful. I knew it would be a magical journey, Margo. Listen, can I, before we, I'd like to ask, see if we can get Mike Porteous on, Joel. And I think he might okay. be, he's on, is he with us? Just before Mike comes on, could I raise something a little bit controversial? Oh, of course, Steve. <laughs> it's not a webinar without you doing that. Yeah, it's quite heartfelt. Um, is it possible we're trying to teach too much specialist stuff? Is it? Is it? I don't know, Dave somebody will have a better knowledge of the literature than me. But what I noticed in my work in South Africa and the brilliant work that, that colleagues out there are doing is that for them, the fundamental message and, and transformation that they're hoping to achieve with practitioners is to move from an expert problem solver to a guide on the side as they put it, a guide on the side. They don't call it motivational imaging, they call it a guide on the side. That that shift in attitude, is it possible that that is the most important transition that promotes, that is really helpful for people and produces better outcomes? And that us motivational interviewing specialists for reasons I understand and share in many respects, we tend to focus on the specialist stuff and, and its beauty, the beauty of these, of these lovely dance steps like reflective listening. And yet, is there a possibility that we are making things more complicated than they really need to be to produce better outcomes? So that's the controversial that, that maybe we're making things much too complicated. And I don't know if there's any study, actually, uh, Molly, you might have a better grasp of this than anyone else here. Is there any study that compares training in, in the fundamentals of the style shift to full on MI? And does it, does it produce any better outcomes for clients or patients. I'm not convinced, or I don't think the research has been done. There you go. No, although that uh, clinically, um, 
like in terms of treatment trials, they've tried to kind of separate spirit from technique. Um, and they both worked equally well, which is the story of randomized clinical trials. But yeah, not in a training study. Okay. So there you go. But <coughs> Joel, I don't know if you want to discuss this anymore, whether we can bring Mike on. Sure. Mike, it's great to see you again. You know, it's always a, it's always a, my pleasure to get your reflections on these conversations. Uh, no, thank you. And thanks for the invite. Um, uh, you started it, I think, um, Steve, by asking, are there, do I see parallels in, uh, in MI and the things you've been discussing and, and sports coaching or the, the way I'm developing my sports coaching? And um, it's definitely parallels. I kind of think of MI as almost like a, a home and a, and a place where I can see people working at a real cutting edge. Um, there's something about the generosity in MI and the skilled, the skillful openness that the that, that people who are trained in MI show. Um, um, and something too, uh, picking up on something you said about this idea of being alongside people, uh, you know, alongside the people who come to me for coaching for big events, but not in the way. I think, I know there's, it's not just a parallel, it's, <laughs> it's driving down the same, same lines together. Um, but it's interesting, there's, I mean, you picked up on, there's so many things I'm scribbling down the phrases because they ring so true for the way I want to be as a coach. Um, that phrase about the knowledge being in the room, I think of it in a very similar way, the, the person who's the real expert in the challenge that we're preparing them for is that person, it's not me. Um, if I'm trying to teach someone to, to, to get into open water swimming, they're the ones who have to feel it, to know it, to, to, to get to a place where they're feeling really comfortable and strong. It's not, it doesn't make any difference at all whether it looks good to me as a coach. Um, what do you do if you notice something, if you notice something that's unhelpful in their technique? It's a bit of a blunt South African question, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah, no, it's very, very um, yeah, but it happens quite a bit. <laughs> so I, I know that this is almost like textbook MI. The first thing I'm, I would do is, is just ask them, do you, would you like to, you know, just stop a moment and let's think about what, what's happening here? Um, Without, you know, without saying, oh, you're doing this wrong and you must do it this way, because I think I know the right way. It's first just asking permission. Do you mind if we, if I interrupt your session and we, and we look at a particular aspect? And it looks to me like you're doing something, but I wonder how that feels in your body. I think if you're going, you know, I, let's say you're hitting the water with a flat arm. I've got a feeling that it's like fighting the water, but what do you, what do you feel? And then I might suggest, well, let's try, let's just try a bit of a tweak and, and off they go. And very typically they'll come back. And the first thing that happens is they look up and they say, how does that look? And I've taught myself to never ever answer that question. I always say, <laughs> tell me first, how did it feel? Did it feel different? Where, where did you feel it? Um, did, you know, in your body, in your muscles, in the way you were moving through the water. And only then I might say, oh, well, I, I could see some of that, but I think we could take it further. Let's try again. See if we can get more of that feeling, which you have, I don't have yet. Um, it's a phrase, I know you've, you, you've heard me go on about this, Steve. It's a phrase I like to use. Who owns the right way? It's not me as a coach standing there watching. 
the right of way is owned by the person who's there doing it. Yeah. Um, That's a good takeaway. There's one, um, one other thought that, that came to mind, if I, if, if I may, because uh, again, it touches on that conversation you were having about how do you do it? How do you do MI? Give me the techniques. Give me the, the list of things that I should say or look for. Um, and as Steve knows, I'm writing a book at the moment about confidence. I've got confidence-centered coaching. How can I, as a coach, make confidence a central part of the way I practice my coaching? And I, I just know that, um, that a lot of coaches, um, if this book ever gets published, will go straight to the bit about how does a coach teach someone confidence? Right. How can I get my athlete to be confident? What are the things to say? What to, what to do? You know, where are the top 10 tips? Um, and uh, these people are going to be disappointed, I'm afraid, because we go through exactly the same steps as you've been talking about. It has to start with my own self-awareness and my own ability to understand what's motivating me. As a coach. As a coach, yeah. Yeah. And then, only then, can I start to understand what's motivating them. The athlete. I wonder I'm how that to, maps on to, to sorry, Steve, Mike. I was just wondering how that maps on to training. What motivates me to be a trainer? To want to help other people learn how to do motivational interviewing. I think Steve touched on a bit of that as well. And there, there's something to that, right? And you know, there there are there are um, things about doing training and getting positive feedback from the trainings you do that give you validation. It can be a trap if you become sort of addicted to it. Um, the um, sharing information and ideas is, 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 is a motivating factor for me. Um, but that, but that, that's an interesting point. You know, what motivates people to want to train people in something like motivational interviewing? And I think for a lot of people, they just want to share it because they got excited by it and they want to share it with other people. And they and then they find it's helpful too in, in helping people change, make changes in their lives. Yeah, yeah. So no, well in I that respect, go, MI practitioners probably in one sense have a clearer run <laughs> ahead of them, you know, because you start uh, you start with that generosity. Unfortunately, a lot of sports coaches don't actually start from that place, they start from a place of Needing, needing to prove themselves professionally, needing to get results, needing to, uh, and so their own motivations sometimes can get a bit tangled up uh, to the point where they're driving people who end up just getting turned off mm. the very thing that we want to be inspiring them with. Yeah, and I think particularly of school teachers while you're talking. How, how tough it is for them to avoid that trap. So it's, I find it very sad, actually, because um, the reason why school teachers become school teachers is they want you to experience the joy of learning. Um, and I'm sure ditto sports coaches and counsellors and trainers as well and yet um i find it sad that the, the system in which they work so often uh gets in the way yeah. well one of the oh, i don't mean to I, be all bleak sorry okay. i was i'm getting I more want to, i want to take a i want to take a hard right turn and i don't think it'll be provocative or controversial but it's something i've wondered about over the years is how has things like proficiency coding changed the way we train people in motivational interviews? Are we training people to pass the test, right? The, 
the motivational interviewing treatment integrity skill code or some of the other valid and reliable measures that people use to assess proficiency. Are, are, are we training people to pass the test? Is the goal to get people proficient in motivational interviewing so they can get the stamp that I'm proficient because it said so on the mighty? Not with initial training. In consultation, because you're going to be, if you're doing consultation with coding and coding, yeah, you are going to be talking about what was missed or what they feel that they could grow from that evaluation. But the initial training, because I code so much, it just, I know when I'm talking about complex reflections, I really can tweak what a good complex reflection in, is and an excellent complex reflection is. And that's because of my, my time with coding. Um, and I had to learn how to get butt out of my double-sided reflections and put and in, and that's directly due to coding and hearing other people with that tick. But has it changed the way you train? It, ha it has in reflective listening and how I teach reflective listening and not just teaching complex reflections, but what makes a great complex reflection and that how it resonates with the client and how the client reacts to it because that is so important. It's the client's reaction. It's not your cleverness. And Steve, you talk about that cleverness a lot. It's not being clever. It's really about responding to what the client needs and how to, how to phrase it so well that the client feels got. And I'm gonna sit back and let Judith talk because she, she had her hand raised before I started talking. <laughs> no, I, I put it up afterwards, Margaret. And um, I just wanted to say, I think it's the context. I think it's like Mike was saying, so I think that coding could be really helpful because I think when people are grappling with something that they really genuinely want to get better at, having some sort of measure of being able to get better at it can be really helpful. And I think that's really different from what you talk about, Joel, of you know, part, you know teaching people to pass the test. And I, I, I think that that's where it could, it starts to fall down. Um, so the context is important. I think when anyone is going to be coded or you're co having been coded or coding others, it makes people feel very vulnerable. There's a vulnerability that people need to be really held. So I think there's the whole thing around how it's done, the context becomes fundamental. And I think it can be useful. And I think the other thing, I mean, like our, the, the authors of things, something like the Mighty would tell us, it's not perfect. It's an imperfect measure. So... In the same way, I guess, Mike, people may try with their outdoor, you know, you know, outdoor swimming, different things. It's not about being perfect, but I think people do want to know sometimes, not everyone, that they're getting better. I think that can be helpful. And I do think personally, when I learned to do mighty coding, which is the coding I, I, I learned to do, I think my training got better because I knew what I was, like Margaret was saying, what I was looking for. There is something in that, but that's been my own personal experience. Others may be different. I certainly wouldn't disagree with what you and Margot say. And I've, I've made this thing like an introductory training when people are learning about MI to mention coding. And then people want to know what the cutoff scores are. And then it's once they see that, it's like, how do I get there? And I know, the, I know it's a process. Mary has a great story, it looks like. She put it in the chat. Can we have her share it with us, Mary? Sure. Yes, we love to hear you, Mary. Yeah, this is, this is a, a large group. I like this. Um, okay, I just got to find her. No, it'd be lovely to, to, to hear your story, Mary. Thanks, All Joe. Right, we're getting there. We've got, we, we're seven minutes off closing, closing time, eh? Okay. That might be a good way to, there you are. All right, Mary, there you go. So we, we can let Mary tell a story and have some reflection and call it a, call it a day. I think it's the most people we've ever had on, Steve. Hey, Mary, there you are. Hello, can you hear me all? Loud and clear. 
I, it said you've been promoted to panelist. And all of a sudden I was like, whoa, I got the, the Molly's comment of I'm scared to be in the presence of, of such, of such uh, wise minds. Um, so I'll, I'll share this little story. So firstly, this is fantastic to listen to. The more I realize I learn about MI training, the more I realize what we don't know. Um, that's just the reality. Um, of it for me and maybe for other folks in this space. And so when I talk about um, trainings at this point, I often will say um, like our learning community, we're all you know looking forward to learning with people rather than my participants because we all learn together. Related to the coding piece, I think it's a lot like the two things in the mighty, the relational and the technical. There's the technical aspect of learning to code and hearing yourself and kind of really getting to fine tune things. But there's the relational. So I had a student, I have my, my MSW students code themselves in a real play um, twice in an, in an online class. And we were forced online to the pandemic. And so I had the student who started out really low, very authoritarian, came from a, an addictions background and um, really kind of struggled to get the concept of reflection, this reflection, that reflection. But at the end of the first assignment, um, I ask an open-ended question and the and basically about the learning process of the assignment. And the person said, when I went back and listened to myself in this real play, I sounded mean. I sounded like a bully. And I know that in my head and my heart, basically, like this person was, you know, like I know that I was trying to help this person, but I just, it didn't sound good. And I, and I just thought like, wow, like, is that me? Is that what I really sound like? And, and so it prompted them. And then the next coding uh, that they submitted, it was just beautiful. And in reflecting on what helped them, you know, concretely this assignment of, of learning to code and coding yourself, but it was hearing themselves and hearing like they were going at it with their agenda and what they wanted. And really it's not about that. And they felt that when they listened to themselves and they listened to the responses. Um, you know, and so this balance of the technical, is this a complex reflection? Is this a simple, what are the nuances of that? But also the relational feel. And it reminds me, Mike, of something that you said, you know, that I, I saw a lot of head nodding for it's, you know, what are our motivations? And so how do we start with that? And then how do we balance that with the other piece? So I, I do imagine, um, you know, that a lot of it is the, the relational and the technical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think most people, thank you, Mary, that was that was a really good way to tie it, a lot of things together for us. And I think most people kind of enter into the, the, the helping work, genuinely wanting to help people, All right? So that, that genuineness is there. They really want to help people. How they do it is, is where the issues come up, like with the student you were just talking about. Um, and I think what motivational interviewing training can do, even in the beginning and the early foundational skills or introduction of motivational interviewing, it can help people become curious about the people they work with as well as themselves, hold people in mind in a different kind of way with the spirit of MI and really emphasize the importance of listening. And I think that if I could get those three points, offer those three points to people in a training, whether or not they go on to be proficient in motivational interviewing, that's a win. And maybe that's all some people need. Any so, guys um, on the side. And, uh, aware as I am that we're coming to the end, I just thought I'd share this story with you, which is um, for many, for probably a year or two, I've been trying to work out what the opposite of a deficit detective is, because I'm well aware that um, people's hearts are in the right place, but sadly, then they look for deficits. 
and correct them. And this is what's probably given rise to motivational interviewing. And I was speaking to a football coach, a soccer coach the other day, who suggested perhaps the opposite of a deficit detective is a treasure hunter. Ah. So um, th thus far, I've not come across a better phrase to describe the opposite of a de deficit detective. And I, and I get that vibe from Mike Porteous, his story about working with a swimmer. Um, he's looking for the, for the treasure inside someone that uh, generates competence and the courage to change. Uh, anyway, I just thought I'd share that with you. I don't mean to be too hippie, but it was the first time I thought, <laughs> yeah, there's a good phrase for the opposite of deficit detective. Yeah. Sorry if you're that bit, sounds... You're a, bit more, you're a bit more woolly and hippie than you like to admit. Yeah, I think I'm getting a bit woolly and it's late in the evening. So forgive me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we are at, 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 at the um, hour and a half. Um, I would like for anybody who'd want to just to share any closing thoughts on um, training MI. It's been a lovely meandering conversation, um, but I'd be interested to hear what people are thinking and we'll just, we'll hang out for a little while. We can start with our initial two panelists, our guests, um, Nikki yeah, and Judith. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Um, I was just listening to what you said, Steve, like the treasure hunter. There's something for me about shining the light, catching people doing things well. There's something about how we do that with the people that we're training, maybe with the people that we're working with. There's something important about catching people doing things well. Um, and it's a lovely way, I think, to pull that together for me. And that's been, yeah, it's been a great meander, actually, Joel. It's made give me lots of, of, of things to think about. The guide on the side is always a, 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 a salutary rem reminder that we don't have to be too complex. I don't think we do. That's just been my thoughts. I'm feeling really similar, too, about the treasure hunter. And, you know, I think um, it makes me think of the clients I work with in general and trying to find or well, not even trying, but just highlighting the things that they do really well that they often don't even realize that is good about them. And so expanding that to training and the people who we're, you know, training and shining, like you said, Judith, that, that light on them as well. So, yeah, and then, you know, and looking for treasure, looking for the thing to affirm, to highlight and show back to them so that they can use that in their own life, in their own way, moving forward. So, yeah. Stephen Berg Smith, out there on the West Coast. What are your thoughts? A modesty and humility when approaching MI training. David earlier said that we're still learning. We don't know what's best. We have a hunch. And what I find exciting is the journey in continuing to discover what are the most effective ways to support people in really developing embodied proficiency in, in motivational interviewing. So modesty, humility, not to overreach or overstate what motivational interviewing is all about and Last but not least, there are so many styles for teaching and training and guiding the learning of MI. And becoming a skilled trainer is finding your style and embracing Absolutely. it and running with Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah, I hear echoes of Steve in that sort of be humble and don't overstate motivational interviewing, you know. Um, Margo. Do you have any closing thoughts about training people in motivational interviewing? You had to have me follow Steve. <laughs> Someone had to. <laughs> that was beautifully said, Steve. I, I, I just want to restate affirming the learner 
as well as the client and affirming in that genuine, honest, individual way, not using someone else's type of affirmation, but using yours that feels that, that if you, I always think if it touches your soul, it touches your heart, then affirm it. If you find value there, affirm it. Don't, and be careful with those affirmations. And I do that in training as well as with my clients is that if someone has that aha moment and they get that light in their eyes, I feel that light and I'll, I'll mention it. I'll talk about that because that's what anchors the learning process, whatever technique we're using. Yeah. Criticism kind of pushes it out the door. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But thank you for having me follow Steve. Oh, no worries. <laughs> Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set Molly up because she has to follow you now. <laughs> what, do you have any closing thoughts, Molly, about training people in motivational interviews? I think my internet is bad. I'm going to be Oops. brief. Okay, we can hear you fine. But now you're frozen. That was really brief. Oh, you can? So, now I can hear you, yes. All right, I'm being told my internet is unstable, but I would just say briefly that it's beautiful to watch people learn motivational interviewing, and I feel fortunate to be part of that process. Yeah. Yeah. And Mike, do you have some thoughts? Then we'll, we'll finish off with Mary. Um, well, obviously, I'm not involved in training MI to anyone. Uh, I think for me, the key word is the generosity of people involved in this area. And there's so many other areas that, you know, me as a sports coach, trying to find um, areas of psychology or whatever that I can draw on. So many of them are, uh, are kind of set up in a proprietary way or a commercial way or a, um, an MI is just so refreshing in that respect, the, the, yeah, just the generosity of sharing what, what you do. Um, so I, yeah, I'm close to tears by, by <laughs> genuinely. I think, I think that's so special to keep it going. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Mary, <laughs> you, I bet you didn't think you'd be closing off the webinar when you signed up. Uh, never in my MI dreams. Um, and, and I don't know that I have a, a closing thought, but, but maybe more of a closing question as, as folks think about, about cool. MI training and their MI training and both facilitating and participating in. But, you know, what, what makes a courageous space? You know, what makes it a courageous space that's conducive to, to collaboration and confidence um, and curiosity? Um, and, and that's going to differ for every, every person all the participants, all the different settings, I imagine. Steve? No, I've got That's nothing more to say. I, I just love the way you use the word Steve because I start imagining that you're talking to me and then I realize, no, you're actually talking about Steve Bergsmith. So I've been enjoying that. No, I've got nothing more to say, guys. I'm just lovely to see you all. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, um, yeah, I don't know that I have much more to add either. It's, I, I think, I think what keeps me doing MI training is a couple of things. One is it's fun. Um, and I enjoy watching other people learn and have fun learning as they go. And that no two trainings are, are the same, even though sometimes the material can be quite similar. And it's, and, and it's such, for me, it's such an honor to get to hang out with colleagues from around the world. And I can share something I know and get their thoughts on it. Um, and, um, and I continue to learn. It continues to keep me inspired and engaged in motivational interviewing um, in terms of develop, helping develop things. Um, and if I have to be completely honest, I don't mind being up on stage and, um, and hamming it up a little bit and telling myself depreciatory jokes and um, 
but it's fun. It's a lot of fun in that way. But it shifted over the years. It's because I want to do it, not because I feel like I have to. And with that, I say we call it a night. <laughs> You're doing some swimming there, Stephen. <laughs> You're not fighting the water, you're going into the water. Okay, I, I can see a training exercise with swimming coming up out of your mind somewhere. Um, all right, guys. Well, hey, everybody, Judith and Nikki, thanks for uh, joining. Everybody else who, who popped in, thanks, really Mark. appreciate it. Always a pleasure thanks. meeting people and seeing people. Um, and everybody who, who's hung out and shared their thoughts and questions, thanks a lot. Um, We'll um, we'll see you next month, and um, we'll see how it goes. Hey, right. thank Thanks you so much. Everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Wherever you are, Keep okay. Bye. Thank you yeah. much. Bye. Bye.